Can these foods help you age backwards? Well, traveling back in time is currently impossible, but healthy food can help support a long, healthy life. So what's happening to our body as we age? Well, first of all, we know that we have remarkably a perhaps endless supply of stem cells. You've heard about stem cell technology as getting a big push. We think about stem cells as these primordial pluripotent cells that are undifferentiated. They haven't decided what they want to be. Uh, they haven't decided whether they want to be a cartilage in your nose or a piece of your heart muscle or a neuron in your brain. They're just kind of standing around waiting for instructions. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because when I started my first business, I really struggled to believe in myself. I was making 300 bucks a month and quit on my business partner. And the thing that saved me was watching the stories of successful entrepreneurs. They gave me strategies as well as hope and belief that just maybe I could do it myself as well. And I hope that this video here today helps you get a little bit more belief in yourself because I still need the videos for myself today too. So today let's learn what you should eat every day to increase your health and longevity. Enjoy. It turns out that we always have stem cells in our body. Uh, some of you may have had your stem cells harvested from your fat and injected in a joint or a shoulder. Uh, you may have had them injected in your heart muscle. Some of you have probably traveled to Mexico to get placental stem cells or embryo stem cells, but that's another subject. The point is we have stem cells available to us, but they just sit there and twiddle their thumbs until they're called into action. So what we wanna do as we advance in years is to continuously call these stem cells into action. And the more we're learning about what stem cells do, the more exciting our options become. First of all, there are foods that support stem cell growth. Interestingly enough, greens, and particularly chlorophyll and spirulina, actually have been shown to keep stem cells healthy. If you really want to know more about this, visit our episode number 165 with the founder of Energy Bits, which are both chlorella and uh, spirulina bits that you can chew. And there's a lot of exciting news on this front. Perhaps one of the most really exciting news is we know that the wall of our gut is probably the most important determinant for how well we age and for how long we live. And as I showed in the Longevity Paradox book, there's very strong evidence that as long as the wall of your gut, which is the same surface area as a tennis court, is intact, then you will continue to be healthy and not wear out. So why talk about stem cells? Well, it turns out one of the biggest set of stem cells is in the wall of our gut. The wall of our gut is constantly replenished. We constantly slough off these cells and replace them with new cells. And the stem cells are what do this. Now, I've shown in my research that vitamin D is essential to make those stem cells actually turn in to new intestinal cells. And in my research, the higher your vitamin D level, the more you encourage those intestinal stem cells to do their thing. The second exciting news is that we now know that polyphenols, those wonderful bright rainbow colors in fruits and vegetables, and that you can also take as supplements and powders, are used by bacteria to not only live, but to produce compounds 
that further enhance stem cell proliferation in the wall of our gut. Third exciting finding is that the more you practice time-restricted eating, the more you compress your eating window to preferably about six to eight hours a day. What does that look like? It means break fast at 11 and finish dinner at 7, or break fast at noon and finish dinner at 6, or combinations. The more you do that, the more you allow for repair of your gut wall, and the more you stimulate stem cell differentiation in the rest of your body. Now, why does that happen? Well, it turns out there's new zombie cells that have been discovered recently that are so named because they are cells that are no longer functioning properly in our body, but have not decided to die. And they're called senescent cells, and there's a ton of them in our body. Sadly, the more senescent cells that we have, the more inflammation that they produce, and the more they occupy spaces where normal healthy cells could be. Now, cells die in one of two ways, and how they die is critically important. If these senescent cells eventually die, they literally die by exploding. And it's got a name called apoptosis. It literally explodes and spews cellular debris around. Our immune system, our white blood cells, go, oh my gosh, you know, there's been an explosion, there's been a disaster, and we're going to be called to the scene, and it actually produces more inflammation. On the other hand, by intermittent fasting, by time-restricted eating, what happens is that these cells, rather than exploding, undergo what's called autophagy. Autophagy means self-eat. And simplistically, what happens is the cell literally reprocesses all the components within the cell, basically takes the cell down to the studs and rebuilds it, recycling the components. And so we can actually tell cells to not explode, but to reprocess themselves and start all over again. So autophagy is what you want. It rebuilds cells without the damage, without explosion. How do you do that? Time-restricted eating. How do you get stem cells to differentiate? Time-restricted eating. How do you get stem cells in the wall of your gut to do their thing? Vitamin D and time-restricted eating. All sorts of great techniques. Now, if you remember in my last book, Unlocking the Keto Code, I stressed another way to enhance stem cell function, and that's mitochondrial uncoupling. We now know that mitochondrial uncoupling, that is having mitochondria not work as hard as they need to, simultaneously stimulating more mitochondria to be born, called mitogenesis, is hallmark to having a healthy body well into our later years. Mitochondrial uncoupling is promoted by ketosis, by eating polyphenols, by practicing intermittent fasting. So you can see how all of these techniques that have stood the test of time, excuse the pun, all produce what we're looking for, and that is fresh, new, healthy cells regardless of our age. And the exciting thing that I've seen in my practice and other people have documented is about every three months, we throw out a cell and build a new one. So that if you're using quality materials, if you're stimulating autophagy, 
you can actually get a whole new you every three months with good material. And that's why you see such healthy agers in their late 90s, early 100s, who do not look old, who do not act old, and that's because they've been practicing this throughout your life. Finally, mushrooms. Mushrooms are an unbelievable food for supporting mitochondrial uncoupling. I don't care which kind of mushroom you get, but eat a host of different mushrooms. Get mushroom supplements. Uh, but most grocery stores now are carrying multiple kinds of mushrooms. If you have a choice between the white button mushroom and the darker ones, get the darker ones. Okay, that's how to live to a ripe old age and die young. Rule number two is get enough omega-3 fatty acids with Sean Stevenson. This is so freaking important. I don't even want this to... If anybody does anything from this episode, I want to make sure that you're getting in enough omega-3 fatty acids in the form of DHA and EPA. So, number one, DHA and EPA have express lanes. If you want to think about the blood-brain barrier being like a toll booth, they have express passes to get into the brain. Like your brain sucks them up like in droves because they're needed for structure of your brain cells. Omega-3s function as structural fats in your brain, creating plasticity, creating stability, and tr signal transduction so your brain cells can actually talk to each other. Without omega-3s, it goes wrong real fast. To the degree, one of the craziest studies in the book, they found that the folks who had the lowest intake of DHA and EPA had the highest rate of brain shrinkage. All right. Your your brain literally shrinks rapidly if you're not getting these fats in. And so what it was was just under 1.2 teaspoons a day. Anything under that increased the rate of brain shrinkage. What are the best three foods or supplements to get your um, DHA and EPA? OK, perfect. Food first, food first. The Journal of Neurology found that folks who consume just one seafood meal per week do, in fact, perform better on cognitive skills tests. I think that's a direct one-to-one -one response to those omega-3s. Uh, but if, you, if you're not taking a, if you're taking a vegan or vegetarian protocol, I've got news for, good news for you, too. Uh, but food first, and then, of course, there's grass-fed beef in that same spectrum, has omega-3s, a high ratio of omega-3s, uh, eggs. The best food source, though, Tom, is not the fish— the fatty fish, but the fatty fish eggs. So salmon roe and caviar can have three times more DHA and EPA than the fish itself. And then we've got, from there, most of the studies done on DHA and EPA is done via fish oil. All right, so I did share some studies in the book that are just really shocking when it comes to fish oil. But then from there, the next rung down is krill oil, right? Krill, that's a microscopic shrimp, super dense in astaxanthin, which makes your body absorb omega-3s even better. It's incredible. And that might be for somebody who's doing a vegetarian protocol, wherever that lies on your ethics, krill oil might be a savior for your brain. If anything, everybody today, even if you're taking a vegan protocol, please get yourself an algae oil, all right? A high quality algae oil. It has the DHA and EPA there, but we don't have clinical studies now to see its effectiveness but we do know that it's there. And I just don't want you to wait around for that data. DHA is so important for your brain. Just to be clear, this is the plant source is ALA, right? This is what you find in chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds. I would have patients get flaxseed oil for years. I was missing the point. It's not the same as DHA and EPA, but it's so important for your brain that your body can convert some ALA into DHA, but you can lose, depending on your metabolism, your unique metabolic fingerprint, you can lose 90% in the conversion process. Mm. And so you'll have to eat five bags of chia seeds a day to get what your brain needs. You know, it's just not doable. And plus, you probably want to leave the bathroom at some point. Um, so that's that's that part. And I also want to share this really quickly with uh, omega-3s and omega-6s. This was a study, and this was published in the journal Nutrients. And it found that a large increase in the ratio of omega-6s in the diet compared to omega-3s directly increases our, our risk of obesity. But here's the most important part. Listen to this. This, another study, and 
this was highlighted, and then I broke this down, and I'm, I'm getting giggy, giddy right now. Another study highlighted an eat smarter found that an imbalance in omega-6s to omega-3s leads to dysfunction of your hunger-related hormones and increased fat storage, even with calories being the same, even with calories being the same, people with a higher intake of omega-6s gained more weight and more body fat and had more dysfunction to their hunger-related hormones, Hmm. all right? Epicaloric controller, omega-3s help to reduce inflammation. Omega-6s are not bad, but we need more omega-3s right now because we've become such a omega-6 dominate society. Rule number three is only love foods that love you back with Dr. Daniel Amen. I come up with this new phrase I just love so much uh, that you only want to love food that loves you back, Mm. that you're in a relationship with food. I think 30% of the mental health problems in America are related to our terrible diet. Uh, that you are what you eat in large part. And if you're eating, I call them the weapons of mass destruction, highly processed, pesticide sprayed, high glycemic, low fiber food-like substances stored in plastic containers, you're not gonna be healthy. Mm. You poison your gut, you're poisoning your brain. And I published three studies now The last one on 35,000 scans, one of the world's largest imaging studies. Tom, you will not believe this. There was a linear correlation on virtually every area of the brain as people's weight went up, the activity and blood flow in their brain went down. I believe it, unfortunately. Healthy weight, overweight, obese, morbidly obese in a linear Mm. fashion. When I saw those graphs, when I was doing the research, I was just like horrified. And I come from a family of fat people. Uh, My dad used to hate when I'd say that, but I have a brother that's 150 pounds overweight and a sister, the same thing. And I know if I just ate everything that looked good to me, I would be too. And no, I'm not having that, especially because I don't want a small brain, Right. right? And And people go, oh, that's fat shaming. And I feel terrible about it because 72% of the country is overweight. Think about that. I mean, how insane is that? 42% of people are obese. The pandemic made it worse. We should be worried about that because the extra fat on your body produces inflammatory cytokines. And we know inflammation is a major cause of depression and dementia, the fat on your body takes healthy testosterone, which we need, which men and women need, and it turns it into unhealthy, cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. That's a bad thing. Fat stores toxins. We need to get serious about being at a healthy weight with healthy food. Mm. Um, And so diet is critical exercise, supplementation, I think is really important. I did a study, 97% of the population um, low on omega-3 fatty acids. And so finding ways to supplement, about 80% of us are deficient in vitamin D. In a pandemic, that's not okay. Nope. Right, because people with low vitamin D actually die more Mm -hmm. if they get COVID-19. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number four is be stress free with david sinclair before we move on from balding to graying there's this sort of like hair thing that a lot of people are familiar with when they age and that is it stops growing on your head it starts growing other places. You get in your nose, your eyebrow hair starts to get long, you get in your ears. What's going on here? We don't really know why hair starts growing in the wrong places, as annoying as it is. 
probably, I think what's happening is that we have this evolutionary program where we used to be a lot hairier six to 10 million years ago. And those stem cells are still ready to grow thick hair in our ears, on our nose, wherever it, you don't want it to grow. And that the changes in the structure of the, of the DNA, the, what we call the epigenome, is changing over time. And that those regions that are normally silent in the ears, so you don't get big hairy ears, are unraveling as part of the aging process. So these are parts of ancient genetic code that have been, uh, that have been allowed to escape from the, from the histones and now they're readable by the cells. Right, and we become our ancestors, unfortunately. So shave or pluck that out for now. But that, what that means is we would predict that if we can slow down aging using the methods that we've talked about in this and other episodes, we should also prevent that process from happening or at least delay it till much later in life. Would that be the case with graying hair too? Uh, it could be because graying is part of not just a genetic program, but can be accelerated by things that are also known to accelerate aging itself, such as psychological stress. And we, this is really interesting because we know from some fairly recent research that stress plays a key, I mean, it's always been sort of known, oh, you're going to make me go gray, right? My grandmother, you're going to make me go gray. And I'd be like, grandma, you're already gray. But um, we've long known that gray hair is associated with stress. Um, what's coming out now is that it doesn't have to be permanent. It's been known for probably centuries that you can have these binary colored hairs where they at the tip of the hair, it's dark, and then it's gray in the middle, and then dark again at the bottom. And people have wondered what the heck is going on. And just recently, in 2021, a group of researchers had a look at what was happening in people's lives during that gray hair growth period. And they found that they were remarkably stressful periods of those people's lives, where, where they, they didn't stop working, they didn't, they didn't sleep, they didn't go on a vacation. And so I think it's very clear that stress can induce gray hair, a loss of color from the hair. But what's also remarkable about, about that finding is that it proves that gray hair is reversible. Which means that what we're talking about here is, is an epigenetic effect. Sure. I mean, anything that is genetic is, is essentially irreversible. Right. So this is an, an epigenetic effect. What I would imagine is that after you've been gray for many, many years, it's going to be very difficult to reverse that. But in the early phases, when you're getting this spattering of gray and color, gray and color, you are able to get those those packages of DNA back to where they were when you were young using some of the methods that we're talking about today and we've talked about in other episodes. And this has to do with those stem cells that produce pigment, they're uh, melanocytes. Yep. And these sit right next to our hair shafts. They do, and they, they inject the color as the keratin is being put together into that, that hair shaft. And the prevailing theory as to why we get gray is that these melanocytes die through a process called apoptosis. Hopefully that isn't true. I think it's true for very late in life, but what we're seeing in this new study is that they become dysfunctional before they die. And that's a period that we have a chance to recover their function uh, and prevent them from dying. And there are a number of ways that I could think of at least to reverse that and prevent them from dying. One way though would be to use some of these adversity memetics to get that epigenome to reset. That's what some researchers have done in mice, at least, in a fairly recent study, actually this year, um, using a combination compound, uh, including uh, cyclosporin A, minoxidil, which is the cream that we talked about earlier, and then another pigment-promoting drug. We dug into this a little today and got really excited by what we found. Yeah, because the paper tries to obscure what this actual chemical is, this age-reversing um, and pigment-promoting drug. Turns out it's called tacrolimus which is a very similar molecule to rapamycin, or also known as sirolimus, which we've mentioned in earlier episodes, is one of the main drugs that can extend lifespan and inhibit this complex of proteins called mTOR that responds to fasting. And like cyclosporin, it's an immunosuppressant, which means it's an adversity mimetic. It's, it's showing your cells that times are not all that great right now. Right, it's making your stem cells freak out that things are going to be rough and maybe we should be rejuvenated and start growing a little better. I just want to mention this cyclosporin A. It's really interesting. You said it's an immunosuppressant. It's used to prevent organ rejection. In my lab, we found it also rejuvenates mitochondria through actually making sure that what's called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore or MPTP is preserved. Long story short, I think this combination of cyclosporin A for mitochondrial activity, minoxidil, which we've talked about is blood flow, improved blood flow, and this pigment promoting, promoting drug, which is basically a, an analog of rapamycin, which simulates a, a fasting response, 
is the triple combo for hair repigmentation. This is not yet ready for human use. Undoubtedly, there's probably somebody trying this out in Hollywood. But as of right now, uh, this is still sometime in the future. I think so. You know, pe- people are already trying rapamycin as a drug, 10 milligrams uh, every week or so. This is, this is only being done by a few people under doctor supervision. But I could imagine that there will be products made available to the general public one day that would definitely restore hair color. It's not a miracle that this happens. It's just science and we're going to figure it out. Rule number five is do intermittent fasting with Raul Jundial. What if you wanted to work on focus and cognition? These things are harder to test, but when you go into the big neuroscience journals, they speak about intermittent fasting. And the best way I can explain it is your brain's a hybrid vehicle. It grew, it evolved through, through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of lots of food scarcity. You didn't eat all the time. And so it's got a backup mechanism called ketones. So after 16 hours, if you don't put glucose in and the liver's done releasing the glucose it's held onto through glycogen reserves, then it'll start burning fat. Mm. It'll clip off those oxygens and hydrogens and they'll make ketones out of it. Intermittent fasting can also help you lose weight. I think that's why most people are interested in it. But it's the way the brain prefers to get its fuel source. And it's based on a diet. Um, Lessons about dieting learned through uh, controlling epilepsy and seizures in kids Mm. in areas where there's no medicine. So I was in Ukraine and when they don't have medicine or a type of seizure, seizure is the abnormal electrical activity of the brain, just like an arrhythmia would be an abnormal electrical activity of the heart. Uh, they would just feed them all-fat diet. You could smell it in the hospitals. So something about an all-fat diet forcing you into just using ketones. Now, intermittent fasting is back and forth, glucose and then ketones, glucose and then ketones. But for kids, if you just get them almost nearly all ketone as the source that goes up to the brain through an all-fat diet, mm their seizure rates go down. You know, so that's proof that food changes mind because the mind is the electricity sparking through that flesh. Mm. Food will change the electricity, detectable, measurable det- electricity in your brain. Food affects mind, food affects brain. With that premise, we can talk about, okay, mind diet will hold off dementia and intermittent fasting might make you feel like you've had a cup of coffee once you get into rhythm out. It's not going to make you smarter, but it'll bring you to your most focused, to bring you to your most attentive. It's not, oh, I'm intermittent fasting and now I can do physics. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not like that. It's your personal best. And then the habits you demonstrate to your family by trying to be at your personal best. And then your kids see that and your friends see that. And I think that's how you impact generation change is to have... Uh, capable people demonstrate, hey, it's not hard, and this is the best we can do for ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. I, uh, I have a very different relationship with intermittent fasting. So I intermittent fast a lot, so I'm fasting almost 20 hours a day. How does it feel? Awesome, but it, do, it isn't additional clarity for me. So what I find is that it changes my relationship to hunger, so I'm not thinking about food in the way that I would be thinking about food if I'm eating over a longer period of time because I'm in ketosis. So if you took mm-hmm. my blood, not now probably because I just had a big meal about three hours ago, but if you had taken my blood this morning at like 10 o'clock, a thousand percent, I was probably posting a 1.5-ish. Mm-hmm. And when I'm in that range, I feel great, but I don't feel extra. Mm-hmm. But I find it is extraordinary for fat loss. So the reason I'm doing it now is so I cycle throughout the year. So in the winter, I worry a lot less about carrying a bit of fat. So I probably fluctuate during the year five to seven pounds probably. And then for the summer, then I'll sharpen back up. And then again, the the cycle repeats. So that I find it really effective for. I find it really effective for changing my relationship to food Food. so that I don't need to eat. If I were gonna miss a meal, not a big deal. If my only choice is to eat something bad versus to skip a meal, then I find that it's, it's just a different relationship. Right, so here's where I think I understand it a little bit differently. It's not like you expect clarity when you pop into ketosis because it's been 16 hours after you've eaten, or since your last meal. It's just the going back and forth over a few weeks, over a few months, 
those months you'll have maybe more clarity than the months before when you weren't doing it. I have a hypothesis about that. That's yeah. testable, uh, let me hear but it. obviously we're not gonna be able to figure it out here. But my gut instinct is, if you're used to a high carbohydrate diet, a thousand percent you'd be like, holy f this is a revolution, uh. my life is so much better, I'm clear, all of that. But because I don't, almost ever have non-vegetable carbohydrates in my diet because if I were to cheat, then I get it. Then I am a little bit foggy. So the delta is less for you since Correct. you already started with a better diet. Yeah, so from a clarity perspective, this lay person, so discount the <laughs> shit out of it, but this lay person's vibe is, or hypothesis is, is that this is a lack of carbohydrate thing that gets people non-vegetable based carbohydrate, that gets people the clarity but there's even another benefit to it, which is it will radically alter your relationship to hunger is probably yeah. a better way to say it than food, yeah. which is pretty interesting. Yeah, so, but that's the whole psychology of the, the feed forward, of, you know, forward loop cycle of eating and then the I don't know that, what does that mean? Well, it's just the, the fact that you get a rush when you eat. Yes. You know, it's, just, it's you're supposed to, I mean, and fat tastes richer because somehow, you know, we figured out it was more advantageous, you know, to have this because it's more nutritious, at least from calorie point of view. Mm. And so those things are set inside us. I mean, if it's good for us, it gives us a rush. Sometimes if it's bad for us, oh, it exactly. gives us a rush. And I love the complexity of that. I love that animals get high. I love that some people think well, that- Stop there. It's, I totally am with you, but explain to people how animals get high. Well, this they eat really fermented funny. food. They bury stuff underneath. They, they, they search certain things in the environment that are, uh, you know, psychoactive, meaning it changes the way they feel. Mm. And what's unique about these substances, like cannabinoids or even nicotine, that when you, as a scientist, I'm reading papers and it says cannabinoid receptors. We have named scientific terms for cannabis inside our body. Mm. There is a nicotine receptor, nicotinic receptors. So that active ingredient, ingredient from tobacco, I'm not saying smoke, but just to understand that the chemicals in plants have perfect locks for which they serve the keys in our bodies. We, we grew with the plants. Mm. We changed with the plants. We use the plants to our advantage. And now the, the plants and the food have, have gone the other way and it's a disadvantage to, for us. And the biggest what do you problem- mean? I don't understand that. Because we're eating too much. Mm. So before food scarcity was uh, an advantage because it kept us from, it was intermittent fasting by, you know, by necessity. Yeah. And that, if you think about it, just conceptually, it's just another hy hypothesis. If during times of hunger you were less sharp or lack of food made you dull rather than sharpened your wits about where the lion was or where the other, where was the berry, where was the fruit, where were the shellfish in Southern South Africa. If it made you dull, that wouldn't be a positive thing. So I think, I think it makes intuitive sense also that just a little bit, and with all respect, I know people can't get food throughout the world, I've traveled the world, I know there's bad food everywhere, but at an intellectual level, for people trying to take it to the next level, is, is a, a bit of food scarcity can actually sharpen your mind. Mm. And neuroscience is trying to understand at the molecular level, what's going on, what's swimming into the brain, and which receptors are being turned on. But I think, I think it does make some intuitive sense. And rule number six, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is think differently with Marissa Peer. I'm gonna tell you today two really exciting things. One is, if you want to, you can become younger. So many years ago, when I was younger, I wrote my first book about how to actually slow down aging, and it really is possible. And when I was writing my book, one of my dearest friends came to me, and she was 35, and she'd actually started going to the menopause, she had no children, she was devastated. And I'm like, look, you can actually reverse the age of your eggs in your womb. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I worked with her, and she had a baby, which was amazing. And then she did go back in the menopause, but many years later, and she was fine because she had her family. So when I was writing my first book many years ago, I met this amazing woman called Ellen Langer, and she had done this really cool experiment. I'm going to share it with you. So she took a group of men, all men of 75, and this was in 1979. I met her many years later. And she took these 75-year-old men to a retreat, and it was a closed retreat. And that means that 
everything was shut. And it looked as if it was from 1959. So all the music that was piped in was from 1959. All the magazines and every newsreel and every paper and every program was from 1979 and, sorry, 59. And it was furnished to be 1959. And it was an experiment. And before they went in, they tested their age. So this is what you can do if you want to be younger. Changing your thoughts and beliefs can make you younger can make you live longer, can make you look and feel better, can give you a great memory into your 90s and beyond, and it can keep you fit and active and healthy. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you, because I'm a great believer that you believe it when you see it. So you see there it says they tested their biological age. No point, your chronological age means you're 75. That is so unimportant. Your birth certificate age, throw it away, never refer to it again. It doesn't mean a thing because we age on our own timetable. So you have an age, maybe, I'd say someone here was 40, that's your age of your birth certificate. If you're a runner, then your age of your organs is very different. A runner of 40 will have a heart and lungs of 30, but knees of 50, and if they run in the sun, skin of 52. So your biological age is completely different, and you can change it. And the thing that changes it is your psychological age, the age you feel. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So they did all these tests, their hearing, their vision, their grip, even the length of their fingers and their blood and their hormones and all these things. And after a week of pretending it was 20 years earlier, pretending it was 1959, not 1970, and they all, every single one of them, reversed their age by a minimum of seven years. Because they did all these tests again, and they were like, wow, these guys are seven to 10 years younger. Of course, we all said, yeah, but it's because they had a holiday for a week. So she has to have a control group. Sorry, I'm just getting used to that. And the control group also went on a holiday for a week to the same place, but they had normal furniture. It was 1979. They actually got older. I guess they didn't like that modern music, but they didn't reverse their aging at all. Anyway, the BBC said, wow, you know, this is so cool. So the BBC in 2010 said, we're going to recreate this, but even better. So they made a closed retreat and they made it 35 years earlier. So they took a group of men and women, it wasn't just men, and they were between the age of 78 and 88, and they took them to a closed retreat. It was 2010, but it all looked like it was 1975. The music was from 1975. The TV shows were from 1975. They have to wear badges of themselves from 1975. And every magazine was from 1975. And they found what was extraordinary is that one of them went in on sticks, one of them could practically not walk, and the same thing happened within a week. They had all reversed their aging by 12 years. That's more than a year, a day. And they asked one of them in particular, what did you do to reverse your aging? Because the one who was in there on crutches was actually running around the garden. There was a woman called Sylvia Sims, and she said, to this day, she now goes to old people's homes and teaches them something, which is you can get older, you do not have to get old. And he said, I forgot to be old. I slipped back into that world of 35 years ago. I forgot I was 88. He'd been really depressed. There was another guy there called Lionel Blair. He was actually tap dancing on stage. So this was a great thing to do because what you have to understand about aging is it cannot be defined. No one has ever been able to define aging. There are tribes, there are groups. There's there's an island in Greece where they have some of the longest living people in the world. They all They all have some stuff in common, which I'll share with you. But actually, what we think of aging, do you know what it is? It is massive disuse of the body, followed by massive disuse of the brain, because the brain is brutal. The brain has what I call use it or lose it. And if you use it, you don't lose it. And if you don't use it, you do lose it. So once the BBC had done this test, and it was so amazing, they said, well, let's do more tests. So they took a group of people, volunteers off the street, and they said, walk into a room and just make sentences of these words. They had a few more words too. So they went into the room, they filmed them walking in, and they got a pen, and they made a sentence with wise, fragile, sentimental, obedient. When they filmed them leaving, they said it was so odd, they were walking 20% slower. They really thought they were fragile. And they were walking like they'd got old. And then, of course, they took another group in the room, and they said, make sentences out of these words. 
And they said they practically bounded out of the room. They were springing out of there, all the same age, because they were using young words. And the words you use have an actual effect on your body. You see, your brain listens to every word you say. If you go, oh my God, I look so old, your brain goes, okay. And that's permanent. But if you go, oh, I look a little tired, I look a little dehydrated, I look a little stressed, your brain goes, yeah, but tomorrow you won't. Because some words are permanent and some words are not. So don't ever go, I'm so old, I'm too old, I look old, I can't do that at my age. I hear people going, oh, I forgot the milk. It's my age. It's like, really? Because my kid comes home from school every week without her swimming trunks and then her lunch. And then she's forgotten her PE kit. And I never go, what's your age? You're just so old. And you only have to hang out in a children's cloakroom to see how much they forget stuff. But we don't go, it's their age. Or people go, oh, I need my sleep at my age. I'm like, my four-year-old needed her sleep when she was four, but I never added to it, it's her age. Actually, it kind of was her age, but... As people get older, they I forgot because my age. I look old because I'm old. My knees hurt because I'm old. You've got to start disregarding your age. If you want to age incredibly well, never mention your age, don't refer to it, because it doesn't matter. So here's the next. You see, this is what aging is. It's an expectation that you live up to. You know, um, you can go to old people's home and see people sitting with their remote control, clicking through the TV shows, getting older. Because when hope dies, old age runs to meet you. But people who don't do that, who still work, you know, professors of 90 have the same brain neurons as professors of 30, because they use their brain all the time. So you want to age well, have a different expectation of what aging is. Scientists know that you can boost your immune system just by thinking differently, which is exactly what those people did with the BBC test. They thought they were younger. Meditation can make you, I promise, 15 years younger. Don't believe me? Go and ask Emily. She'll tell you. Because you can't stop... Yeah, she's really 62, but that's a secret. <laughs> and I'm really 82. But we, we don't ever discuss our age. You see, you make different chemicals when you're happy, when you're depressed... Your whole immune system is depressed with you. There's so, this is such a hot topic, um, you know, when you just put into like keto, fasting, all this stuff, you're just like, okay, carnivore, or even like, you know, feel like Michaela Peterson has made the lion's diet a thing now. So what is it? What are you trying to say with this book? What is the diet? What are you saying is the problem and what is the solution? Well, so I've, I've had a ketogenic version of my, of my diet uh, since I did it, and it's in actually all the books. And interestingly enough, if you look at the ketogenic version of the plant paradox, there's a whole lot of carbohydrates in there. And people do extremely well on that program. So when I was doing the energy paradox, my last book, uh, I wanted to kind of explain how ketones made your mitochondria, the little energy producing organelles in all of our cells, really super efficient and really highly efficient at burning fat for fuel. And I like to document with studies, with evidence, what I say. And so as I'm looking up all the studies that I'd uh, accrued, and started reading them even closer. And I go, wait a minute, this is everything I'm saying and all the keto experts are saying is wrong. Keto is, ketones are a horrible fuel. Uh, they are not some super fuel. They, yeah, sorry. Um, huh. This is. I knew you were going to tell me something that was going to be like, what? Yeah. And I go, what? And I go, wait a minute, you know, but uh, you know, I'm teaching and everybody's teaching and all the keto experts are teaching that they're a super fuel and they're not. Uh, this was actually worked out uh, at Harvard and the NIH uh, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even in the 2000s on humans. So um, briefly, um, even at a full ketogenic diet where you're producing massive amounts of ketones. Ketones can only supply 30% of the energy needs of a human being, 30%. And yeah, sorry, 
Um, this was Dr. Owen's work from Harvard, uh, published in 2004. And even at full ketosis, ketones can only meet 60 to 70% of the brain's energy needs, and the brain still needs 30 to 40% glucose, sugar, to run. Oh, wow. Because I feel like the, the word on the street is like you can use fat for fuel or, or sugar for fuel. Those are your two fuels, That's the main true. fuels that they yeah. use, the body uses first. That's true. That's true. Um, muscles will use ketones after a three-day starvation fast. Muscles will use ketones as a fuel. Mm -hmm. But as you go beyond three days, muscles shift to using free fatty acids as a fuel and could care less about ketones. Um, mm -hmm. So what are ketones doing? Well, ketones, free fatty acids, our mitochondria love, they'll make, they'll make ATP just fine. The problem with free fatty acids are that they're too big to get through what's called the blood-brain barrier. It's literally a barrier for things to pass through to get to the brain. Mm -hmm. And so you could have free fatty acids floating all around, uh, but they can't get to the brain. So and what, what do we get free fatty acids from? So free fatty acids come out of our fat. Okay. Okay. So it's, just, we, it's, it's some energy that gets liberated from the fat that can be used in the body. Correct. As okay. a fuel. Okay. Your mitochondria normally, if you have what's called metabolic flexibility, you should be able to burn sugar as a fuel. And then as the sugar dries up, you shift to burning free fatty acids as a fuel. And the best example is a hybrid car. Uh, while you're burning gasoline, you're hopefully charging the battery. So it's like, well, you're eating carbohydrates and protein. Whatever is extra, you'll put into storage as fat. If the gasoline runs out, then we call on the battery to start supplying power for, you know, keep us moving. So the fat is our battery and free fatty acids are broken, pulled out of the battery to power the engine when glucose is no longer available. That's how we're designed. Now, the bad news is that and I talk about this in the book, 50% of normal weight Americans do not have metabolic flexibility. 50% cannot switch, cannot tap their battery. Overweight Americans, 88% of them are metabolically inflexible. Mm -hmm. And obese Americans, 99% are metabolically inflexible. So mm -hmm. the important thing about this with ketones is that Ketones are only made normally by free fatty acids coming out of fat cells, going to the liver, and the liver converts them into short-chain saturated fats that are water-soluble water called ketones mm -hmm. or ketone mm -hmm. bodies, and they can go to the brain and serve as a temporary emergency fuel for the brain until we find some glucose. Okay, so, so it doesn't there, get used right away. It's just it's like there's a it, delay. It's just yeah. It's like you know, hold on, you know, food's coming. Hold on, don't die. But you know, this will do for now. The problem is if you're not metabolically flexible and you stop eating, or even you eat a eighty percent fat diet, insulin. People have heard of insulin resistance by now. If you're not metabolically flexible, you have a high insulin level, and insulin actually blocks fat from being released from fat stores. Mm. So you could have tons of fat, but if your insulin level is elevated, and I can tell you that most Americans' insulin level is elevated, then you could stop eating. You could eat an 80% fat diet, and it may take weeks for insulin to fall enough that you can start putting free fatty acids out to be turned into ketone. And that explains the keto flu, the Adkins blues, 
And it's not even that easy to get into ketosis from what I've that's, learned. It's actually very, I listened to Dr. Rhonda Patrick talking about that and how she had to keep testing herself and she just had to keep pouring fat on the things to even get into ketosis. And she could get kicked out super easily by too much spinach. But I've got the trick. Okay. And that's unlocking the keto code. Believe it or not, you don't have to eat a lot of fat to get into ketosis. Okay. Yay. Yeah. One of so one of the tricks that I in all my books, um, most people now have heard of MCT oil, medium yep. chain triglycerides. Yep. Medium chain triglycerides uh, are absorbed as a fat in a totally different way than any other fat. They're absorbed directly through the wall of our gut, and they, unlike any other fat, go directly to our liver. You know, do not pass go to not collect two hundred dollars and are made instantly into ketones. No matter what you're eating. So wow. you could you could have a plate of spinach, you could have a fruit salad, please don't, but you could have a fruit salad and take a tablespoon of MCT oil and you will be in ketosis. Jeez. Nice. That's really helpful. I've got some of that. Yeah. Now uh MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, and generally are named after the goat, capra. And so there's capric acid, caprylic acid, caprolic acid. They're all words for goat. Why did they name it for goat? Turns out that goat milk and sheep milk is 30% medium chain triglycerides, MCTs. Yes. Can I eat goat cheese then? So you can have goat cheese. You can have sheep cheese. You can have goat yogurt. You can have sheep yogurt. Well, I'm going to switch out for my cashew, fake goat oh, cheese cashew, and for the real thing. Yeah. And so you will make ketones just by oh. eating goat cheese and sheep cheese. Wow. And I've got tons of recipes in the book. Of, so you could, I mean, you could, you know, have yourself some goat yogurt and put some polyphenols, which we'll talk about in a bit, maybe, uh, in it, and you'll go into ketosis. Let's be clear. Nobody knows what the perfect diet is, sure. even when it comes to fasting. It's all largely based on rodent studies. So what I can tell you about the rodent studies, which I'm very familiar with, is that if you take a rodent and reduce its calories by 25% for its whole life, it will live longer, 30%, but it'll be really miserable and aggressive. <laughs> Uh, and that's true for us as well. I've tried calorie restriction for about a week and I gave up, I was pretty angry. But what we discovered, our, my colleagues um, discovered, is that if you, it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat that's mm -hmm. important. And what's been found is that if, as long as you have that period of hunger um, in a mouse, so you can feed them every other day, then they can gorge themselves as much as they want. And they do, they eat about 90% of what a mouse having free access to food would eat. Uh, but they, they have the same longevity benefit as a mouse that's always been hungry. And if that's true, what that means is for us is that we can enjoy life as long as we have that period of hunger once a day or maybe twice a week. And I believe the only reason we age, um, uh, you know, we could live for a thousand years otherwise, the only reason we age is that our repair systems become complacent. You mentioned that what, what is beneficial for you when you're young comebacks to bite you when you're old. What we think is that these repair systems are very good when we're young. So the idea is it's called antagonistic pleiotropy, and I think it's right, and that is that we evolve to stay healthy and alive and fit till we're 40, and then the, the forces of natural selection decline after that because we've essentially bred, right. we've often had children, but we don't need to stick around beyond that, and building a, a body that will last a thousand years is pointless at that, you know. So most species only live as long as they need to to reproduce, and then a little bit more. If you're a mouse that could die within two years, they only build a body that lasts two years. If you're a whale that has no predators, you can live for a couple of hundred years. That makes more sense. Why, why does the whale live for a couple hundred years? Like, I would say it's pretty safe to say certainly um, at some point in our past, we became a pretty clear apex predator. It's not that things couldn't take us out, but I mean, yeah. by and large, obviously look at, at how far we've come, they didn't. So why would we only live to 40? Is it that whales continue to breed and be yeah. um, useful in that sense? So that's really super interesting. and Very few people talk about this. The reason is that we were not at the apex of the food chain until recently. 
but in a world where we typically would die from starvation or from war, mm. a lot of men didn't make it to 40 because of that. We were at the you know, middle of the food chain. Only now we, we actually we barely have a chance of dying before 70 or 80 mm. unless we're unlucky. You know, give us another five million years of evolution, we could evolve 200 year lifespans. That's what should happen if evolution continues. A whale has been at the apex for about 30 million years, mm. and they've been allowed to evolve those long lifespans. We are just like them. We share most of their genes. They're warm-blooded, they produce milk, they're conscious, they're basically us in the sea. So anyone who says we've reached our maximum limit doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm. Talk to me about this notion of resetting the biological clock. How do we do that? What's the mechanism? And so obviously um, going hungry occasionally, exercise is gonna help, but I know that you have a regimen that I'll lovingly call a regimen of drugs or precursors to things um, that we can take. What can we do to reset that biological clock? Mm -hmm. Well, there are different levels to resetting aging. Uh, there are three levels that we know of. The first is pretty easy to reset uh, or to, to manipulate. These are the proteins that turn um, genes on and off very quickly. We call them transcription factors. Mm. And they, they basically read a gene and make a protein. That's what they do. Uh, that's level one, that's easy. Go a little bit hungry, that'll change. Level two is a little bit harder. The level two is not just changing which genes are quickly turned on and off, but actually silencing genes for, mm. for a long time. And this is where my enzymes that we work on, the sirtuins, come into play. Let's go back to the Pac-Man. They clip off acetals off these packing proteins. You spool up the hose and it becomes, becomes locked in. That, that gene gets silenced for a long time. So to do that, you can exercise, you can diet, but you also, I think you need a little bit of help as well. What gets really interesting, and this is something most scientists don't even know about yet, is level three, the deep layer of aging there's actually a DNA clock that tells our bodies how old we are. We, I could take your blood and read it, and I could tell you roughly when you're gonna die. What? Yeah, we can do that. What Just, are you looking for? We're looking for chemical groups that get added and subtracted to our DNA, the, the long string uh -huh. in the cell. You get chemical modifications in predictable ways as you get older, starting from conception. So even in the womb, even as a kid, even as a teenager, you're aging based on this clock that goes up linearly. And where you fit on that line is very accurate that tells you your biological age. But how do you know when the person's gonna die? Is that just based you on just actual draw a straight tables? Line. Is it actuarial tables though? The human average uh, human lifespan is 86. And is that what you mean? Or is there could you see something specific in my line that would say, ooh, you're headed for 68, sorry. Uh, no, it's not, not specific, but what it's based on is machine learning based on thousands of people's um, code of methylation yep. on the genome and comparing that to their health and their date of death. Oh, f that's so interesting. So if you were to take my blood right now, what would you look for exactly? We would read the methylation. The chem these are chemicals, hydrogen yep. and oxygen bound to the DNA, chemically, physically bound, um, and those accumulate as you get older in very predictable ways. In fact, they're so predictable that we can use the same clock to measure the do a dog's age and a human's age. Whoa, all based on methylation. Right. Okay, what causes methylation? Well, there are two classes of enzymes, the ones that add the methyl chemicals and mm -hmm. those that subtract it. Okay, how do I take a boatload of ones that subtract it? Ah, that's what we're working on. Now, here's the key, level two aging reset which we can do by some of the things that I'm doing in my life, yep. probably you are too, those aren't permanent changes. You can't just do that and expect that, take, take one treatment and you go on living for another 10 years. Okay. Because level two isn't as permanent. It's somewhat permanent than level one, but level three is truly permanent. It, you could reset yourself 10 years and then go back and then wait another 10 years and potentially reset mm. the clock again if you know how to do that and we're just starting to figure out how to do that. The secret to being healthy is being happy. The secret to being healthy is being happy. The more stressed out you are, the more you feel like you're living out of alignment with your goals and dreams, the more you feel like you're not making any kind of progress in your business or your career, the more you feel like the work you do doesn't matter and your relationships don't matter, that's gonna lead you down a path of anxiety, depression, illness, sickness, disease, Suicide is a, it's a really 
dangerous slippery slope but the more you feel happy <laughs> that today matters that good things are going to happen to you guess what they're more likely to actually happen people ask me all the time evan how are you so positive all the time well i'm not positive all the time i mean that's an impossibly high standard but i try not to be negative that much and when negative things happen to me i try not them i try not to let them ruin my entire day let alone my entire week or my entire month right uh, people also are, are shocked when they find out that i'm 41 years old they ask me how old am i i'm 41 born in 1980 like what how are you 41 you look a lot younger it's like well thank you but i think a lot of it has to do with happiness like when you love the thing that you're actually doing when you're excited when you have energy it, it exudes through you and has the impact on other people as well i've been asked on a bunch of health shows what's your number one secret for good health and people expect to hear diet or exercise or sleep i think the number one secret for good health is being happy is loving the work that you're doing is feeling like you're doing something important and so maybe that's backed up by the science by now but it feels intuitively right to me and, and let me share with you a couple ways of how to do it okay well that's great evan be happy <laughs> well how do we actually do it so let me share some things that have worked in my life that i that hope can have an impact in yours as, as well so number one is try to run a no crisis life a no crisis business and a no crisis life one of the things that i stressed out over a lot when i first started my company was always being at the beck and call of other people. I used to pride myself on responding to emails really quickly. I used to use Outlook back in the day and anytime an email came in, there was a little alert that came off. Alert, new email, like, oh. And so I had to stop what I was doing and then go respond to this email. And that, that cycle would reinforce itself because anytime somebody then responded, they say, wow, you're so fast on answering email. And that would make me wanna answer it even faster the next time. What I ended up finding out though was I kept dealing with other people's emergencies, other people's requests for my time, other people's agenda for what they wanted me to do. And I dealt with all those things and I never got the stuff I wanted to do. <laughs> it never got done because I kept being distracted to go answer these emails or respond to that message. And so I had to make a conscious choice to say, I want to run a no crisis business. And if a client needs me for something that is urgent, I don't want that kind of client. If we need to respond to customer service, which I believe is really important, I'm gonna hire people to help me do that. But I, I don't wanna be in the business where I have to be on call, urgent responding to people because it stresses me out and I don't wanna be in that business. So how can you design a no crisis business? Same thing for uh, your life. You know, for me, I love living in this condo. Uh, a lot of the stuff is taken care of. You know, we don't have roof issues or having to mow the lawn or things that break down and having to call somebody and because the air conditioner is broken or the toilet doesn't work or, oh, I mean, all the stuff. I built a 5,000 square foot custom home and sold it to move into the condo because it's, it's a much lower crisis life. And when you don't have a lot of crisis in your life and in your business, holy cow, you can be a lot happier. <laughs> and that positivity allows you to be more creative, to be more productive, to care more about others, to give more into others. When you're stressed out, not only is it bad for your health, you're not showing up for other people, right? You're not being caring for other people. You're not thinking of other people. You're not investing into your customers or your, or your relationships or your team because you're still too stressed out dealing with your own issues. But when you can relieve some of those things, it allows you to pour into other people. Just a, a quick example from my life. The past three weeks have been actually pretty stressful. Um, we have been looking at different real estate options. We have been looking at uh, different financial options. I'm, I'm diving deep into uh, buy, borrow, die. If you look at that up as a financial strategy, I've been learning about crypto. I've been learning about NFTs. I've been learning about infinite banking pause. Good afternoon. This is your building superintendent. Thank you for your patience. We've concluded the monthly generator test. All elevators in both towers are fully operational. Enjoy the rest of your day. So that's a great example, right? Like, sure, that's a minor interruption to me filming videos for you guys. But a lot of stuff is just taken care of. So the past two weeks have been 
have been more stressful and have led to things bleeding into my calendar. I've let them happen. I didn't put enough guardrails around my calendar. Think of bled into my calendar and I'm doing things on days that I normally aren't doing things. And it's led to me feeling more anxiety and stress. And so over the weekend, this past weekend, I decided, you know what? I'm doing things on the day that I said I was gonna do things on and that's it. And that means saying no to people. And as a result, uh, I'm feeling this on a Tuesday. Since then, what was Sunday, it's like, oh, Life feels good again. Life feels really good again. Why am I so happy again? There's so much more energy again <laughs> because I feel like I'm back in control. And so setting up a no crisis business, no crisis life can free up just so much energy for you and will make you a lot happier. Step number two to make that happen is be in control of your calendar. You have goals, you have ambitions of what a, a dream life looks like for you, right? Perfect. Your actions need to map to your ambitions. So what's in your calendar should reflect your goals. You say you want to be here. You say you want this kind of uh, marriage, this kind of body, this kind of business, this kind of financial success, whatever your goals are. Great. Until they're habits, until you're doing the work, nothing's going to happen. You're never going to achieve that thing without it being a habit that you're doing consistently. So where are your habits tracked? In your calendar. Show me your calendar and you'll be able to see your outcomes. So you have to be protective over your calendar. And the stress that I had over the past couple of weeks was because I let things run over my calendar too much and I had to take back control. When somebody wanted to meet with me because I became obsessed about something, one of the things I fight with is I get obsessed over things. And so I became obsessed with under, understanding NFTs and Discord and buy, borrow, die, and all sorts of these concepts. And so I wanna meet with somebody and I wanna learn it. And so, yes, okay, yeah, I could squeeze that in there. Oh, I can squeeze this in here. And then I wasn't getting the other stuff done that I was supposed to do on those days. So let the stress. So same thing for you. What are your goals? What do you wanna accomplish? You have enough time. When people say, I don't have enough time, audit your schedule. Like if, if you were gonna sit next to you and watch what you're doing all day, is every hour that you're spending really productive? Is every hour you're spending really intentional? Probably not, right? So before you decide to do something like give up on sleep, people ask me, well, how much do you sleep? I sleep as long as I need to sleep. I don't set an alarm in the morning and I sleep as long as my body tells me to sleep. You know, I think before worrying about giving up sleep, you don't have to only sleep five hours a night. You know, I'll sleep seven and a half to eight and a half hours a night. Right? Some, some days more, some days less, but that's my typical range. That's what my body needs, depending on how busy a day I had the night before. Before you worry about giving up an hour of sleep, audit how you're doing with the time that you're awake. You know, if you're gonna sleep eight hours, perfect. You're awake for 16 hours. Are 16 of your hours with intention, with efficiency, with with clarity of how you're gonna spend that time? Probably not, right? So before you worry about now, you're, you're not being productive or intentional with your 16 hours, what makes you think that now you're gonna be productive and, and intentional with 20 hours, you know, and now you've slept four less hours? Right? So focus instead on the hours that you are awake and put it in your calendar. Your goals have to map to the actions that you've got, right? You say you want this, show it to me in your calendar and then put guardrails up around those things. It really, really, really matters. When you can do that, it, it takes a few hard no's because people will want you to do things and they'll want you to do things on their timelines. And that may mean you have to say no. You will have to say no. You'll have to say no to family. You have to say no to customers. You have to say no to team. But when you can set up the right time to make things happen, it makes things so much happier and easier for everybody. So as an example, I film my videos on a Tuesday. Today's a Tuesday. I don't know when the video is going to be released, but I film it on a Tuesday so I can stay in the zone of just creating. All I have to worry about today is making lots of YouTube videos. Yesterday was Monday and I'm, I'm only focused on my team. And so my team knows that, hey, if they're messaging me on a Tuesday, it better be urgent. Like it better be crazy urgent. And I run a no crisis business. So it better be something insane. Otherwise, don't message me on a Tuesday, right? Because it's going to interrupt my flow. It means I have to stop doing this video to see what message you sent. And so that better be really, 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 really important. And that very rarely comes up. It's not that it's actually no crisis. We'll have something every now and then that comes up but they know that it, it, it better be just insanely important. So very rarely happens. So I'm not there for my team on a Tuesday, right? I'm not there for my team 
on a, on a filming day like this. But I'm all in on Mondays. I'm all in helping my team on Mondays. And so what I do is I ask them, hey, if you need me within 24 hours, email me. If you need me within a week, then let's discuss it on our Monday call. If I'm going to meet you on Monday, let's discuss it on Monday. Save up the things that are important and save it for Monday for our call. And I will be there, not distracted, not checking my phone, not thinking YouTube, not thinking about anything else except you on Monday. And what that does is allow you to really over deliver on the thing that you're doing as opposed to being scatterbrained all over the place. So chunking your time and then setting up the guardrails around that so that people don't step all over it is really, really, really important. And when you can feel like there's always a spot in your calendar to get that thing done, it reduces stress dramatically. So if I'm worried about my YouTube channel, like, oh my gosh, you gotta make videos. Oof, oh, when are we gonna make videos? When you don't have it in your calendar and when you don't feel like you have enough time, how much of your stress comes from you feeling like you don't have enough time to do something, right? Raise your hand, is that you, right? How much of your stress comes from you feeling like you do not have enough time? If you had a spot in your calendar where you knew you would have the time to do it, it, re it reduces a lot of the stress. So for me, Tuesday is going to be YouTube day. If I get an idea for making videos, if I'm thinking about making content, I know, oh, I've got Tuesday to do it. I'll send myself an email and on Tuesday, I'll get to it. Wednesday's my project day. So when I have ideas for what I want to do in my business to grow it, uh, other projects to work on, if I'm working on my funnels or my landing page or my book or whatever I'm working on, I have a spot on my calendar for it. So I don't stress out. It's like, I don't have enough time to do things. Yes, I do. I've designed my life around it. I'm just going to hit it on Wednesday. I'm not going to allow distractions to carry me off course, right? It's being willing to let go of the little balls to go for the big ones. You either, you have to pick. You're either constantly taking these little balls and getting these little wins, answering super promptly on email, responding to everybody right away, taking out these little small bites all the time, but then never having time to work on the big project, or you chunk off time to work on your big projects in life and your business, and that means some of these little balls are gonna drop, and that's okay. And you can't judge yourself for losing some of those because what you're gonna make here is magic, okay? Chunking your time, setting up the rails becomes super important. And then the last thing I say is you have to love the actual process. You wanna be happy? Love your work. How much time do you spend working? A lot, right? Especially if you're an entrepreneur, you spend a lot of time working. Love your work. The number one rule for success from the people that I profiled, from entrepreneurs to athletes to musicians, like you love the actual thing that you're doing. Where a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up is you love the end result. You love the impact that it can make. You love the idea of buying a house or, or riding a jet plane or whatever, the outcome. But you don't love the path to get there. And if you're just, I'll do whatever it takes, you won't. You won't do whatever it takes to get to the outcome and you'll be stressed out to the max along the way. So rather than doing that, flip it to say, I, want, I need to love the work that I'm doing and have it provide economic value to other people so I can get paid to do it. That's a secret. That the outcome is fantastic, it's great, uh, awesome. Hey, I got a million subscribers, Where, where's the thing? I got a million subscribers back there, great. That's the outcome. I love helping, like I love making these videos. I love feeling like this video will matter and mean something. If you're only chasing the number, you're never gonna get there and you're gonna hate your life in the process. Good health, I firmly believe, comes down to happiness. Yes, diet, exercise, all of that, but if you are stressed out, if you hate your life, if you despise who you're hanging out with, it's just really hard to be healthy. Where if you can now with intention design a life where happiness is a priority. How many times have you designed your calendar in your life around you being happy? What a concept. <laughs> if you can make that happen, I guarantee you, you're going to be healthier. You're going to feel like you're contributing a lot more. You're going to have a lot more energy. You're going to be a better person for the people around you, and you're going to build a much better business in the process as well. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, 
I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To learn the five habits that will improve your health, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. We know it will allow us to live longer. It will give us more energy. It will boost our willpower. They said the blueprints of life, you know, all diseases are created from genes.